Are you here to meet Miss Alexander? Oh dear, I hear she isn't coming. Oh no. I heard she was called away on an urgent expedition. <laughs> she won't return for several weeks. Oh, how unfortunate. I had truly wished to meet her. Well, uh, I guess there's nothing left for us to do but go our separate ways for the evening. <laughs> Farewell, everyone. See you later. See you later. Thank you. Oh, my. Damn it. Well, I guess you figured me out. I, uh, I am Annie Alexander. You must forgive me. It isn't that I don't wish to speak with you. It's that I don't wish to speak with you about myself. I know what people have said about me, that I laid the foundation for conservation, education, and research programs that would go on to become the model for modern American museums. Blah, blah, blah. Yes. I did fund and design two of the most successful museums on the West Coast, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology and the Museum of Paleontology. And yes, money is still contributed to them annually from my estate. And yes, I do despise publicity with every fiber of my being. Until my dying day, I ask that all of my donations be set on the books as a gift from a friend of the university. When will these people start to understand that I am not the important one here? The specimens themselves are of value. Very well. I understand that you are here at the behest of a museum. <laughs> yes. For its sake, and the sake of the scientific knowledge I will inevitably impart, I will tell you my story. Born in Honolulu in 1867, I grew up on Maui on the slopes of Haiku with my family. My father, Samuel Thomas Alexander, was the greatest man I have ever met. And it was from this robust and adventurous fellow that I would inherit a love of collecting specimens from the natural world and asking questions about them. <laughs> what is it called? Where did it come from? How does it fit into the bigger picture? There was a curious fascination for the both of us in attempting things where the chances for success were but the very slightest. It was with this reckless fascination that Papa started Alexander and Baldwin Incorporated. Huh? A sugar business? that would go on to join the ranks of the Big Five, the island's most successful sugar company. Ever my father's daughter, I sought to prove to him that I too could run a thrifty business. So when Papa's business partner, Henry Baldwin, said that he would pay me 25 cents for every avocado seedling I could gather, well, I set to the task with unmatched tenacity. <laughs> was he shocked when I returned with an ox cart full of seedlings and a bill for $75. <laughs> I was a tomboy with a penchant for rambling through forests and gulches, searching for land shells and ferns. And on those nights when half the universe shone down upon us, we built bonfires on the slopes of the mountains and stood in the smoke until our clothes were covered in soot. People naturally counted amongst their blessings to have a roof over their head at night. How oppressive that roof feels after time spent in nature. As I grew older, I accompanied Papa on all of his adventures. We hunted, collected flowers, studied birds and photographed mammals. All of this changed dramatically, however, when Papa took ill. On the advice of his doctors, we picked up and moved to a drier climate, Oakland, California. <laughs> Possibly the dullest place on the face of the earth. My mother and friends encouraged me to combat my new melancholy by 
finding a husband and settling down. I quickly put an end to their efforts for the sake of the local menfolk. <laughs> if I hadn't, I surmised there'd be a good many headless bodies and battered frames lying about Oakland streets. It was a strange discovery that led me to pull this depression from my back and sling it away from me. I began to attend lectures at the University of California, Berkeley. My range of interest was wide, but nothing captured my imagination like paleontology. Oh, what a fever the study of old earth set up in me. I fell in love with the tales of the saber-toothed tigers whose fangs drift with the blood of the Oriodons in a world much older than the slopes and valleys of my native Hawaii. It was in these early, delicate days, filled with intellectual doubt and self-loathing, that paleontology would become my first, my lifelong passion. I attempted to fill the gaps of the stories of these strange, extinct gods by examining their closest living relations. My burgeoning interest in modern osteology, the study of bones, led me first to acquire some dog skulls. <laughs> My experiences concerning this first quest are too revolting to relate. But suffice it to say, I made two trips to the pound and bought a new clothes boiler at Mama's request. Of course, Papa supported my new interests and aided me whenever he could. It was this support that led us into the heart of a new world. In 1904, Papa and I embarked on an 800-mile trek on foot into the wilds of Africa. It was to be the opportunity of a lifetime. The purpose of the trip was to collect wildlife, both on film and as trophies. I captured countless photographs of sure-footed zebras numbering in the hundreds. <laughs> Families of giraffes walking in single file like so many ships in the forest and the native people who went about dressed in skins. <laughs> I flourished in the heat. In fact, I had never felt in better health. I had become a woman of blood, enamored with firearms and the chase. Papa joked that if he or his gun bearer were unable to handle a lion, I would simply seize the beast by the tail and throw it 20 feet away from us. <laughs> As our journey neared its end, Papa began to express feelings of foreboding disaster. I laughed at his unfounded fears. Nothing could ever stop a man of his wit and will. Ignoring his premonition, we forged ahead, and before long we found ourselves in the chasm where the water gushes from Victoria Falls, the largest waterfall in the world. So entranced were we by the sight, we failed to notice the loose rocks tumbling down the precipice towards us. Hearing a sharp sound, I turned to see a boulder hurling down the cliff, and before I could cry out, it struck Papa in the leg, crushing his foot. I dragged Papa up the cliff face, cringing at his agonized cry. By the time we reached the residence of the local doctor, he had already lost a great deal of blood. His hip was mangled, his leg fractured, and his foot utterly crushed. The doctor counseled emergency amputation, but even such extreme measures proved futile. Papa passed away on September 10th, 1904. He was 67 years old. I buried him in a small cemetery in Livingston, Zambia. An eternity resting under the African sun does not sound so terrible. Death is always so much harder on the living. I felt so terribly alone. I did not feel as though I could make it true. He had been so alive, and I had known him so well. Every curve of his face, every tone of his voice. gone, and I had to move on. I felt that I 
needed to do something to divert my mind and absorb my interest. Papa and I had always shared collecting and a fascination with nature. So I thought it was only right to use the money that he had left me to preserve something that might otherwise be lost. It occurred to me that there was no museum on the West Coast dedicated solely to the collection and study of its native species. So in 1907, I wrote a letter to the University of California, Berkeley, the birthplace of my lust for collecting, and proposed a building of a museum dedicated solely to the research of the flora and fauna of the West Coast. I offered to provide the capital for the construction of the building, the salaries of the staff, and fund all of the field expeditions. To my delight, they agreed. <laughs> With plans underway for the museum building itself, the next step was to create its collection. A series of trips to Alaska and its surrounding islands would provide its nucleus. I decided to invite a lady with me on one of these adventures, a school teacher from Oakland. The woman was a recent acquaintance of mine who wished to learn how to put up specimens and take notes. <laughs> to my surprise and delight, she took to field work like a fish to water. <laughs> I never dreamed that her inclusion in the trip would change my life. Her name was Louise Kellogg, and I contend that she was the greatest discovery of the trip. She rarely left my side for the next 40 years. Louise and I could hardly convince ourselves to go back to plain life in Oakland when there were so many specimens left to collect, luring us on. Collecting gave us purpose. Rarely did a year pass that we did not embark on some new expedition into the wild. Every drop of blood within me was for this outdoor life. Digging in heat so blistering we were forced to parade around in nothing but our shoes and stockings. <laughs> Prying a specimen out of a frozen trap with a screwdriver. <laughs> Feeling such hunger that even a large kangaroo rat tasted as good as chicken. <laughs> In total, we contributed over 34,000 fossil, plant, and animal species to the Berkeley Campus Museums via these trips. You may ask what my objective was in such painstaking collections. When approached with investment opportunities, I would simply refer to the research room filled with students and say, these are my investments. <laughs> these young people are the missionaries of science who will go on to carry the museum's philosophies long after my time has come to an end. I can hardly think of an investment with more promise. A collector's work is never done. <laughs> it's strange how absorbing the work is you forget about the outside world. I was walking along one day with a light step, feeling young and happy, and the wind blew a wisp of white hair across my face. Well, I had no trouble recognizing the arrival of age in a paleontological specimen, but I could not see it in myself. I celebrated my 80th birthday camping underneath the oaks and pines. I contend that one twilight year is a very appropriate pe period for field work. It is better to wear out than to rust out. <laughs> That's what I always say. I suffered a stroke on November 11, 1949, and lapsed into a coma that would last ten months. All the while, Louise continued to write in my journal. Her final entry, dated September 10th, 1950, exactly 46 years to the day since Papa had passed. Read simply, Denise. It was my time. I had lived life the way that I wanted without depending on anyone. And I was happy. As Goethe once said, Keep not standing fixed and rooted. Bravely venture. 
briskly row. I'm glad you persuaded me to speak with you this evening, but I must go. There's work to be done. I've never heard it said that any branch of science could be exhausted. <laughs> so, as Louise and I always sang, I'll away to the fossil land. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs>